Good morning. Can you hear me all right? You can turn the microphone on. Okay. Uh, as Jason said, uh, my name is Stephen Kirkland with FEMSA Training and Qualification Center in Oklahoma City. Been there for about three years. Three years. July 8th was three years. Um, prior to that, I worked at the Naval Base down in San Diego. I worked there for about four years as a pipe fitter, uh, taking care of uh, the master meter distribution system that we had on base. So, uh, yeah, I took care of uh, all of the naval bases in the San Diego metropolitan area. Point Loma, North Island, Coronado. We even went out to uh, the uh, Marine Corps Air Station there, Miramar. But uh, we took care of all that when I was working under the utility, the Civil Utilities Division there. Uh, worked there for four years, like I said, before I took the job and decided to leave Southern California and move to Oklahoma. And uh, so, yeah, I, I catch a lot for, you know, that. Why would you leave Southern California to go to Oklahoma? Yeah, well, it was a pretty doggone good job offer. Plus, I wanted to get back into the pipeline industry. So I'm, you know, back in the natural gas industry, uh, basically using my knowledge and experience and in, in teaching inspectors. But uh, I did work for a municipally owned utility company in the state of Florida. I'm originally from Florida, Alachua County, Gainesville area, North Central Florida, Go Gators. So uh, I'm a Florida, I'm, a, I'm from Florida, so not, not Georgia. So my, you know, I got a little bit of a Southern twang or whatever in my accent. It's from North Central Florida, not Georgia. Uh, I did work for the distribution company there. For 21 years, my primary expertise when I was working for that company was natural gas measurement and pressure regulation. And within our city, though, we had about probably eight master meter operators that we sold gas to. And so I had a little bit of experience working with those master meter operators. Um, I would go around every single month after we did our odorant sniff test. And I would give each one of those master meter operators a copy of the report that we did every month when we did our odor and sniff test, just to help them out. Here you go. What do I need that for? Well, this is proof that you're getting odorized gas and you're, you got odorized gas in your system. Now you just need to do your sniff test. So I was kind of working with them and helping them out. So I'm a little bit familiar with master meter operators. But what we're going to talk about here today is operator qualifications. And being a master meter operator, how many are LPG, small LPG? Or yeah, you got small LPG? Yeah. So uh, being a small LPG or master meter operator, you know uh, there are certain sections of Part 192 where um, small operators, master meter operators, and small LPG operators, you guys get a, an exception. You know, uh, you might not have to submit an annual report. You might not have to have a full-blown public awareness program. You might not uh, have to go out and spend two or $3,000 on an instrument to do your uh, odorant concentration tests. So there's some areas of code where you guys basically get a pass, right? But OQ is not one of those areas, okay? We're talking about Code of Federal Regulations, Part 192, Subpart N. And uh, like I said, this is an area that uh, applies to everybody, anybody who operates a pipeline. So let me get going here. This might be a little bit of a review for some of you guys. Um, if you've never, how many people here have been exposed or involved in the operator qualification program? So it's going to be a little bit of a review. But you might learn some things you never heard before. Yeah, I clicked the wrong button. So what we're going to do here on this presentation, we're going to talk about, we're going to go over the scope of 192 subpart N. We don't have any liquid operators in the room, so we're not going to talk about sub, uh, we're not going to talk about 195 and subpart G. Uh, if you have a friend who has a liquid pipeline, um, you can tell them that it's 195 subpart G, operator qualification. We're going to talk about some OQ related terms. Uh, that some people have confusion about. Uh, we're going to clarify those. We're going to differentiate between training and qualification. We're going to talk about what is the difference between training 
versus qualification. If a person receives training, does that mean they're qualified? We're going to talk about how those two kind of relate and interact. Um, then we're going to discuss the different elements that your written program is required to have. And uh, the reason we're going to cover these areas is uh, mostly what we found is this is where a lot of operators tend to fall short. You look at 805, 192, 805, there's basically a checklist of everything that your written program shall include. And this is kind of where a lot of operators tend to fall short. So that's why we wanted to focus on that. But moving right along, the scope. This rule applies to the operator. That's the person, you the, the person that owns the pipeline. You're considered the operator. You own the pipeline, you're operating the pipeline, you might have 10 employees, you might have 100 employees, but you own the pipeline, you're the operator. Any contractors that you bring in to work on your pipeline, the OQ rule applies to contractors. If you bring in contractors to do leak survey, you have to make sure that they are, uh, they're, they're, they're OQ qualified and their OQ qualifications meet your program. If your program says that they have to have a written test and a performance on the job evaluation to be considered qualified and they submit to you their OQ qualification records and you look and you say, well, uh, their qualification process doesn't line up with our program. Okay, you need to make sure any contractors that are working for you, their OQ needs to line up with your program. Any subcontractors, if you hire a contractor and he hires subcontractors to work under him. His subcontractors have to meet the OQ requirements of your program. Any other entity performing a covered task on behalf of the pipeline operator, this includes emergency responders, okay? Subpart N, it applies to all of these people. So basically, anybody who touches your pipeline to do maintenance or work if they're performing a task on your pipeline that we have determined or you have determined to be a covered task, they have to be qualified. Or, here's the caveat, okay? Um, I'll give you an example. We used to have uh, a person come in every year and do maintenance on our odorant injection equipment, okay? This is what they did. This is what the, the guy did it year round. This was his job. He would go from company to company to company performing maintenance on these YZ Inject 300 odor and injection systems, right? So rather than have to keep our employees up to speed on proficiency, we decided we're going to contract with this company and let them do our maintenance. Okay, so what we did was because working on an odor, odor and injection was considered a uh, covered task, and we said it was going to be a one-to-one -one span of control. We had one of our qualified technicians who was qualified sit with the guy and basically babysit him while he was working on the odor and injection foam, directly observing everything he did, so we were covered. He was a non-qualified person working on our pipeline, but he was directed and observed by one of our qualified technicians. And that's kind of the way we handled that situation. So let's talk about some of the definitions. What is a covered task? Well, if you look in 192, uh, a covered task, there's basically four questions that you have to ask yourself. It's commonly referred to as the four-part test, right? Is it performed on a pipeline facility? Is it an operations and maintenance task? Is it performed as a requirement of this part? Meaning, is it required by 192 that you perform this action? And will it affect the operation or integrity of the pipeline? Will its performance or its lack of performance, if somebody does it or fails to do it, is it going to affect 
could it affect the integrity of the pipeline? If somebody does it improperly or if somebody neglects to do it, for example, leak survey. If somebody neglects to do leak survey uh, as required by part 192, that could affect the integrity of the pipeline. You don't detect leaks, you can't fix leaks, right? So uh, the thing to keep in mind is um, covered task is an activity identified by the operator that meets the four part test that's specified in 192.801B, okay? These are not specified by the Code of Federal Regulations. The Code of Federal Regulations doesn't step in and tell you, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Operator, these are your covered tasks for your system. They don't do that. It's up to you as the operator or the owner of that pipeline, it's your job to determine what your covered tasks are. And you follow that four, four part test and usually you'll uh, end up with a good list of covered tasks. So a lot of times people say, well, it's not an operation and maintenance task. Define operation. What do you mean by operation? Well, if we go back to the simple dictionary definition, starting, stopping, monitoring, or controlling a device or a system is considered operations. That's, that's an operation. You're operating a pipeline. You're starting, stopping, monitoring, controlling a device or a system. That's operating. What is maintenance? Maintenance is simply the act of maintaining what you're starting, stopping, monitoring, controlling, right? So you're operating and maintaining a pipeline. So the people that, um, you know, want to be very analytical, split hairs, you know, what do you mean by operation and maintenance? Well, that's the basic simple dictionary definition of operation and maintenance. But, uh, and you can apply that to other areas of the code as well, you know, operation and maintenance. For operation and maintenance procedures as referred to OQ, we're talking about starting, stopping, monitoring, or controlling a device or a system and maintaining the work or keeping something in proper conditions is maintenance. Here's another one where uh, people like to be analytical and start splitting hairs. Well, it's not applicable to me because this isn't a pipeline facility. What is a pipeline facility? Right? We all know what a pipeline is, right? But they, they, they caused a little bit of confusion when they throw the word facility on the end of it. What is a pipeline facility? Okay. And it can be new, new pipe, new existing pipe. It could include the right of way that the pipe is laying in. Any equipment, facility, or building that is used in the transportation of gas or in the treatment of gas during the course of transportation. I'll give you an example. Um, we had odor and injection pumps in our gate stations. Okay. It wasn't technically part of the pipeline, but it was connected to the pipeline. We were treating the gas by injecting odorant, right? We were treating the gas before it went into our distribution system. So that injects odorization pump was considered part of our pipeline facility. Everybody see how that works? If you have a compressor station and, you know, that compressor station, while it may not be in line as part of the pipeline, but it is connected to the pipeline. If you look in 192.801A, there's actually a definition uh, and I'll read it to you real quick. It says, all parts of those physical facilities through which gas moves in transportation, including pipe, valves, and other appurtenances attached to the pipe, compressor units, metering stations, regulator stations, delivery stations, holders, and fabricated assembly. So that's a big, huge mouthful to just say your pipe, and anything attached to it that is uh, contributing or enabling the transportation of gas. So you can't say, well, that's not the pipe. That's my odor and injection pump. It's not part of the facility. Yes, it is. It's connected to the pipe. It's part of your pipeline facility. So, 
covered task. Let's 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 talk about a couple of these. We talked about the uh, four part test a little bit. <clears throat> Welding or joining of pipe is that a covered task? You think? Let's let's run through it real quick. Is it performed on a pipeline facility? Yes. Is it an operation and maintenance task? Yes. Is it performed as a requirement of this part? Part 192 requires us to repair leaks, right? How do you repair a leak on a steel pipe? You might have to cut a section out and weld in a new pup, right? A new section of pipe needs to be welded in. That's required by the part. Will it affect the integrity of the pipeline? Yes. So all four questions we answered yes to. So welding is a covered task. If they're if 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 their welding certification, um, if their welder qualification meets what your program requires, then you can say, okay, you can weld on my pipeline. They need to be OQ qualified according to your program. Yeah, you could you could specify how you want. Now I'll talk about that in just a minute about um, how welding, just because you certified under API 1104, or Section 9 ASME Boiler Pressure Vessel Code, or even Appendix C in 192. That doesn't mean you're OQ qualified to perform that task, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you see here, excavation is on there. Is it performed on a pipeline facility? Yes. So we're answering yes to all these questions. But what about meter reading? Is it performed on a pipeline facility? Yes. Is it an operation and maintenance task? Yes. Is it required by this part? Is there anywhere in part 192 that says you have to go out and read meters? Nope. So there's the first no. If somebody forgets to go read the meter next month, is it going to impact the integrity or the safety of your pipeline or the operation of your pipeline? Nope. Might impact your billing, but uh not going to impact the operation or integrity of the pipeline, and it's not required by Part 192 to go out and read meters. So meter reading is not a covered task. Okay, if you're going to have meter readers that go out and do nothing but read meters, they don't have to be OQ qualified to read meters. Okay, but if you're going to use your meter readers for other things, like the company I work for, um, we used our meter readers to do our atmospheric corrosion survey every three years. So we went in and we OQ qualified all of our meter readers to do atmospheric corrosion survey because we thought, well, the easiest way to do the atmospheric corrosion survey on all the meter installations is have the meter readers look at it. They look at every single meter in town once a month. So they would go out while they're reading the meters, they would look at it, they would inspect it for atmospheric corrosion, if they found atmospheric corrosion, they would put the code in their handheld device. When they got back to the shop and they uploaded their handheld device, a rusted gas line work order was automatically generated and sent to the meter shop. But we had to OQ qualify them to do that survey. That was the only thing. They had to be OQ qualified to perform that survey for us. So we had OQ records for 30 something meter readers saying that, yes, they're qualified to uh, do an atmospheric corrosion survey. So let's talk about abnormal operating conditions. What is an abnormal operating condition? <clears throat> Similar to covered tasks, an abnormal operating condition is a condition that is identified by you, the operator. Once again, you're not going to get a list from part 192 that says these are your AOCs for this covered task. Okay, you as the operator, you have to determine what are the abnormal operating conditions that might be encountered when your employees or whenever you perform this particular task. 
It's a condition identified by the operator that can indicate a malfunction of a component or deviation from normal operations that could indicate uh, conditions exceeding design limits or it could result in hazard to persons, property, or the environment. That's an abnormal operating condition. Um, we put relief valves in our reg stations, right? So we don't want the pressure downstream of the reg station to go over MAOP. We put relief valves in. Under normal operating conditions, that thing just sits out there looking pretty, right? Fresh paint job, looking great. Nice, shiny, stainless steel control lines. All it does is sit out there and look pretty under normal operating conditions, right? But if you have a, a pressure control failure, then it goes to work, right? Then it opens and starts blowing gas to atmosphere, okay? That could be considered an abnormal operating condition associated with regulator maintenance, right? I'm out there working on my reg station. I'm performing regulator maintenance on my regulators. Maybe I'm rebuilding them. Maybe I'm replacing the diaphragm elements. When I go to put it back in service, something happened. It's not operating properly. Now, for some reason, the pressure is going crazy. It's getting too high downstream. My relief valve opens up and starts blowing gas to atmosphere. You know, relief valve operation. That could be listed as an AOC for working on reg stations. Um, anything that's not normal, an abnormal operating condition. Pressure gets too high from your reg station. That's an abnormal operating condition. You're doing valve maintenance. You turn the valve, operate the valve to make sure it works good. Now all of a sudden the stem packing's leaking. Okay? It would have sat out there for 30 years and never leaked if you hadn't have touched it. Right? But you touched it, you moved it, now the stem packing's leaking. Now you got to go get your lubrication gun off of the truck and come back out there and hook it up and pump some more lubricant in there and see if you can get it to stop leaking. If you're still using those old plug valves. I started with a gas company. That's what I basically cut my teeth on, right? Those old Nordstrom and Rockwell plug valves, the ones that get really difficult to turn, especially if they're using, we used to use this, uh, we had this lubricant we bought from Nordstrom. It looked like green Play-Doh. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was thick as clay. And we would pump that into the valves. And... You go back a year later and you had to put a six foot cheater bar on your wrench to move that valve. And then thank God we got away from that stuff. And we started using some different lubricant from, uh, I think we bought it from a company in Texas called Valtex. But uh, anyway, but abnormal operating condition, it's identified by the operator, okay? For every covered task you decide, okay, this is gonna be a covered task on our system, all right? Now you have to sit down with your subject matter experts, the people that actually do it, and say, all right, what are some abnormal operating conditions that we might experience while we're performing this covered task? The valve is seized. It won't move. Valve leaks. You know, broken bolt. You know, I give a scenario where uh, you have a leak on the bonnet on one of these old plug valves and you pull out your breaker bar and 15, 16 socket and you put it on that nut and you're trying to tighten that nut up a little bit to stop it from leaking and the nut breaks, the bolt breaks. Now you got a really bad leak, okay? That's an abnormal operating condition. What are you gonna do? But all these abnormal operating conditions, this is again, like covered task, identified by you, the operator. You don't, you don't have a list of abnormal operating conditions for the AOCs. You can't submit your list of covered tasks to FEMSA and then we're gonna send you back a list of AOCs. That's, it's up to you guys. You determine what the AOCs are. What does qualified mean? In reference to subpart N, qualified means that the individual has been evaluated and they can both perform the assigned covered task and they can recognize and react to abnormal operating conditions. Okay, that means you've evaluated them, 
They've demonstrated the knowledge, skills, and abilities to both perform the covered task properly and recognize and react appropriately to abnormal operating conditions. When we say react to abnormal operating conditions, we don't mean uh, run like the sky is falling, okay? They need to know what to do immediately, okay? If there's an abnormal operating condition on the pipeline, um, that's not the time for them to run back to the truck and call the supervisor and say, hey, this just happened, what do I do now? If they have to do that, they should not have been performing that covered task. They need to know immediately what action do I need to take to mitigate this situation, whether it's turn the valve off, put the reg run, put it on bypass, you know, shut the emergency shutoff valve down, whatever they need to do, they should know immediately when that abnormal operating condition presents itself, they need to know immediately what action do I need to take to mitigate this, this, this situation. Okay, let's talk about training versus qualification. Um, training is basically the actor process or a method that one uses to gain skill and knowledge. Training is where you improve someone's knowledge base. Okay, we're going to work on uh, putting, you know, data in. We're going to work on, you know, giving them information that they didn't have before so they can be knowledgeable of the subject. Um, training normally uh, in a classroom setting uh, is not going to develop skill or ability. Training is simply going to improve someone's knowledge. Um, just a, a real quick scenario. If uh, I just had, if I own a gas company and uh, I just had a bunch of people retire and now I'm shorthanded on people for doing leak survey or valve maintenance and I decide I'm going to take all the new guys we just hired, bring them into a classroom setting, we're going to run them through six hours of training on doing valve maintenance and leak survey and we have them sign in on a roster. So I got a roster of who all attended the training. Um, you know, everybody lived through the presentation. So I say, blessings on you. You can go do valve maintenance and leak survey now. Do you think that's adequate? No. Why? I'm, I, I tested their knowledge. I'm out, maybe I gave a written test at the end of the class. Okay? They all passed. So I've, I've evaluated their knowledge. But the one thing I haven't evaluated, I haven't evaluated their skill and ability to actually perform the covered task. Right? That's where qualification comes in. Okay, qualification means that they have demonstrated through evaluation that they can perform the covered task sufficiently and properly, and they have the knowledge to recognize and react appropriately to the AOC associated with that covered task. Now, if we have an evaluation process in place. It needs to evaluate <clears throat> their ability to recognize and react to AOC. And uh, but training is the process where knowledge and skills are acquired. Training is not the process where somebody is qualified. It's a part of the process. It is not the complete process. Qualification is a result of the evaluation process where you determine that the person demonstrates their knowledge, skill, and ability to perform the task and recognize and react to AOCs. The individual must have knowledge and skill and ability to, to perform the covered task and recognize and react to AOCs. So for example, uh, being a qualified welder or qualified joiner doesn't automatically mean that you're OQ qualified to perform welding or qualifications. And I'll tell you why, because whether they qualified under API 1104, Section 9, ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, or Appendix C of 192, none of those welding qualification processes, 1104, ASME, or uh, Appendix C and 192, none of those processes 
require evaluating their ability to recognize and react to AOCs, all right? Um, does it mean they can't weld? No. Am I gonna, am I gonna have uh, suspicions about their ability to weld? No. If they certified under API 1104, I have no doubt in my mind they can strike an arc, they can run that bead, and they can make it pretty like a row of dimes, okay? Um, I'm not questioning their ability to weld. I need to know, do they have the knowledge and ability to recognize and react to the AOCs that I have identified for my pipeline that might be encountered while they're performing their welding task? So they need to be evaluated. They need to know, okay, what AOCs might you encounter while you're welding on this pipeline? They need... Well, one AOC that's always present when you're doing welding operations is burn through. Burn through is always an AOC for welding operations, whether it's an energized pipe or a depressurized pipe. You're always going to have burn through. Burn through should be listed as an AOC for any welding operation. If they've got the heat turned up too high, if they're using a MIG welder and they don't have their uh, travel speed set right, they got the heat turned up too high. Uh, maybe the operator's not that experienced. Maybe he's moving too slow. Maybe he's staying in one spot too long. And next thing you know, boop, the puddle drops through. That's an AOC. Because under normal operating conditions, he wouldn't have had burn through, right? So burn through is always a, a possibility for welding. So there should always be uh, that at least that one, <laughs> you know, burn through. But so that's what you have to do. You have to keep into consideration, um, even though they certified under, you know, probably the most stringent welding certification program out there, it doesn't talk about AOCs. And in order to be qualified, according to subpart N, they have to be evaluated, knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform the task. Okay, they certified under 1104. We know they can perform the task. I'm satisfied with that. They also have to be evaluated on their ability to recognize and react to AOC. That's where 1104 and ASME and Appendix C fall short. They don't talk about AOCs. That's basically just a welding test to verify that you can weld. Well, they need to be able to know how to recognize and react to AOCs. If they certified under 1104, that demonstrates that they have the ability to weld, okay? Um, but an AOC, an abnormal operating condition that could present itself during the welding process is burn through. They need to know how to recognize that and react to it. Yeah. That could be part of your evaluation process. Your evaluation process could be performance evaluation on the job coupled with a written exam or an oral examination. So when they come to your shop and they say, hey, I'm the new welder, and you say, okay, let me see your credentials. They show you all their certification. I got 1104. I got Section 9 ASME. I even did the 8-inch butt well for, you know, Appendix C and 192. Then you say, what about your OQ? And then they look at you like a cow looking at a new gate, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Huh? What? You say, your operator qualifications. And then they say, well, uh, I didn't know I had to have that. Well, yeah, you got to have that. Well, then you can run them through your evaluation process. And qualify. Yeah. You can qualify them under your program. Your program requires that they pass a written test on AOCs and they do a performance evaluation on the job. Maybe you can have them do a weld right there in the shop before they get out on the job site and have one of your welding inspectors take a look at it. They show you their 1104 certification. To me, that would satisfy the performance evaluation part. Now you give them a written test to talk about AOCs. If they pass that written test, that would satisfy their uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities to recognize and react to AOCs. But you can't just accept an 1104 certification 
and let them just take off and start welding on your pipeline because they're not OQ qualified. They're certified to weld, but they're not OQ qualified to weld on your pipeline because they haven't met the evaluation process or the qualification process that you've established for your pipeline. And the OQ stuff always drives me nuts. It just drives me nuts. It's like, it's, it's like, it's well, that's the biggest part is. The chicken or the egg. Well, they got to have that, they got to have that, uh, they got to, you got to have that documentation that they have been evaluated and demonstrated that they can recognize and react to the AOCs. They demonstrated their welding proficiency by passing the 1104 certification test. Now, do you know how to, rec do you know the AOCs and are you going to be able to recognize and react to them appropriately? As a certified welder, I have a sheet for each of my AOCs. Do you be able to recognize the correct process or not? Sure, I can do that. I'll find that the welder in the back. Well, they have to be tested or evaluated. I mean, a burn through, you can't burn through obviously a digital. I know. Your battery is running low. No, then over. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just, uh, I want to, it's nice, I deal with it as a time that you don't fall asleep. What you could do is if you have a particular company that you routinely contract with. Well, no, I mean, it's going to be a one off kind of thing. And that's what I run into the problem. I don't run into the problem with that contract. People who do normal contract stuff. They typically are trained and are, are qualified to say, it's that guy that I'm like, hey, I need to build this riser and man. You know, weld this pipe up for me. Are no. qualified? And you got all the certification. Yes, I do. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought to qualify. After this week, too, I'm like, okay, now I need, somebody needs to qualify him. I can qualify him. Well, here's the caveat. Unless California's got a more stringent rule, new construction is not an operation and maintenance task. Unless you're building an alternative MAOP pipeline. So new construction, you can have them welded up. But as soon as you commission that pipeline and put it in service, that same welder that built it can't come back and make a repair unless he's OQ qualified. Now, I don't know, has California put a more stringent rule in place than that? Hey, we're fixing to spend a couple of million. <laughs> So if you look here, for example, okay. here's the basic welding test under Appendix C in 192. If you read through that, if they perform that basic welding test and pass, according to 192, they are a certified pipeline welder. But there's not one word in this whole process that talks about recognizing and reacting to AOCs. That's why we're saying just because they're certified to be a welder under 1104 or Appendix C or uh, Section 9 of ASME Boiler Pressure Vessel Code, that doesn't mean they're OQ qualified. They have to be OQ qualified if they're going to perform a covered task on your pipeline. Yeah. yeah. If they're going to remember, a covered task has to be an operation and maintenance task. Yeah. But we just talked about new construction. It's not operation and maintenance, so subpart so in, you know, it's not a covered task.
they can build it. Once you've commissioned it, they can't come back and work on it unless you, you get them OQ qualified. Ability to recognize and react to abnormal operating conditions must be a part of your evaluation process. Okay? Ability to recognize and react to abnormal operating conditions. The individual must know all the AOCs associated with the covered task and how to respond appropriately. Once again, that doesn't mean run like the sky is falling. Okay? That means you need to take immediate action to mitigate that situation. Immediate action, that doesn't include running to the truck and calling your supervisor. We need you to do something right now, whether it's turn this valve off, put this regulator run on bypass until you fix, fix the problem, whatever, whatever immediate action needs to be taken, they need to know. And you need to evaluate that. It has to be part of the evaluation process. So, for example, if your evaluation process includes a written test, okay, a lot of companies, the company I work for, for initial qualification, you had to take a written test, okay? We want to test your knowledge. If you're going to do a written test as part of your evaluation process, there should be some questions on that written test talking about AOCs for that covered task. Whatever covered task you're trying to qualify that person for, if you're using a written test to evaluate their knowledge, some of those questions on that test should talk about AOCs. If you're doing performance evaluation coupled with an oral examination, a lot of companies will do that. Our company, subsequent evaluations, we did performance on the job with an oral examination. So we would go out, we would actually watch the person performing the task, and while they're performing the covered task, we would ask them questions, right? And we had a set list of questions. So every person that got evaluated got asked the same questions, right? So we didn't go out there with our buddy, ask him all the easy questions, and then go out there with that guy that you don't like and ask him all the hard questions, right? Everybody got asked the same questions. And the questions were all concerning abnormal operating conditions associated with that covered task. So that has to be part of your evaluation process. You need to be able to say with a straight face and look anybody in the face, look Jason in the face or Matthew, whoever comes out to inspect your system when they're looking at your OQ, OQ program and they say, uh, do you evaluate your employees to make sure they can recognize and react to abnormal operating conditions? Yes, we do. And feel good about yourself because you didn't have to lie today, right? You need to be able to stand up and tell anybody, yes, we are evaluating their knowledge, skills, and abilities to recognize and react to AOCs. Here's our evaluation process. Here's one of the written tests they take for initial qualifications. And here's the oral examination questions that we ask when we do a performance evaluation on the job coupled with an oral examination. You know, give all that stuff to the inspector and he sees all that. Okay, shoot. You guys are jam up and jelly tight. On to the next inspection. All right? So your program. <clears throat> this is in 192.805. You notice the word uh, right there at the end. It said, each operator shall have and follow. Those words are highlighted or bolded. You need to have a program. You need to follow that program. Whatever program you write, you need to follow it. Okay, so California is uh, including, uh, California considers new construction. You have to be OQ qualified to perform new construction tasks. So, okay, well, that's why I ask because. The thing is, like we said before, I think Leticia covered it a little bit too. Um, this is the minimum federal safety standards, okay? Each individual state um, has the ability to implement more stringent rules, but they can't be less stringent, okay? For example, um, if your inspection interval for valve maintenance is once each calendar year, not to exceed a 15-month interval, 
the state of California could step in and say, yeah, we don't think that's uh, we don't think that's frequent enough. We want them to do it uh, twice each calendar year, not to exceed a six month interval. They can do that. It's perfectly within their rights as a, a, a state. Um, not too good for you guys, but it's you know, yeah, they have that right. You know, state partners, they they have that right. They can implement more stringent rules. So we talk about the program a little bit. Notice the last sentence there. The program shall include provisions to one. You need to tell us how you're identifying covered tasks. Even if the statement simply says, uh, covered tasks shall be identified in accordance with 192.801B, uh, identifying covered tasks according to the four-part test. Okay, great. You're doing it like 192 says do it. A lot of operators will adopt a covered task list from ASME B31Q. You guys heard of ASME B31Q? Okay. Well, it's a standard that's out there that talks about operator qualifications. Um, evaluation. You need to put it in your program. How are you going to evaluate people? Um, non-qualified individuals performing covered tasks. You need to have provisions in there to talk about non-qualified people performing covered tasks. Why would we do that? You know, training. How are they going to learn if they never get to do it, right? You can't have somebody read a book and take a written test and then turn them loose to go do valve maintenance. They got to go out, you know, the company I work for, we, once they finish their initial training, uh, you know, they got joined at the hip with one of our seasoned veterans who was qualified, and they would go out and they would work side by side with this guy and get OJT, right, on the job training from a qualified technician. And once that qualified technician came back to me and said, hey, he's ready to go for his performance evaluation, then I would go out and do a performance evaluation and say, okay, good to go. Now you can do valve maintenance by yourself, or you can be in charge of it anyway. I'll send the next helper out with you. <laughs> that's kind of how we did it. But you need to explain that in your system, in your program. Uh, how are you going to evaluate individuals who might have been involved in an accident or an incident? Somebody went out there to perform a covered test. They didn't follow procedure. Their actions contributed to an incident. How are you going to handle that situation? That needs to be part of your program. Part of your written program needs to address that. How is my company going to handle this situation? And it will present itself eventually. Maybe not in your career or your career, but at some point in time, somebody is going to do something. They're not going to follow proper procedure. They're going to maybe forget to turn the valve off before they take a plug out or whatever, and they're going to cause an incident. And <clears throat> what about uh, how are you going to evaluate people who you feel like may no longer be qualified to perform a cover test? due to physical limitations or other limitations. How are you going to communicate change? If you change something in your program, how are you going to communicate that change to all of your employees that are performing those covered tasks? All the people, I mean, you know, whether you got two employees or whether you got 20, those people need to be told. They need to be brought up to speed with the latest procedure. You took covered tasks away from certain groups, Reassign them to other groups. They need to know. Hey, we don't do valve maintenance anymore. That went over to the shop in uh, San Isidro or, or wherever, you know. And uh, you need to identify evaluation intervals. In addition to identifying what evaluation methods we're going to use, you need to identify what are my evaluation intervals. And, and there's also a caveat in there. You need to notify FEMSA of any significant changes after July 1st. 2020. So we're going to go through each one of these. Evaluation methods. What are you going to do for, how are you going to evaluate your people? It can be written. It can be oral. Uh, when the OQ rule first came into effect, I don't know how many people were still here. How many people you guys were working in the industry in 1999? Okay, well, I'll just tell a real quick history lesson on it. The rule went into effect in October 1999. FEMSA gave all of the pipeline operators a three-year period where they could do transitional qualifications. All they had to do was a work performance review. Look at your work history. If you were performing that covered task 
before the rule went into effect, then they could say, by work performance review history, this individual is qualified. But after 2002, after that three-year period was over, they're not allowed to do that anymore. So there should be nobody left out there who has a qualification by work performance history review, right? That was, you're talking about that chicken before the, which come first, the chicken or the egg? That's how they covered that, okay? Um, your evaluation method, if it's observation, are you doing on-the-job training? That's part of your training process, right? On-the-job performance, on-the-job performance. If you go out and evaluate somebody by on-the-job performance, it cannot be the sole evaluation method. And that was put into place after December 16, 2004, you can no longer do uh, performance evaluation on the job as the sole evaluation method. Okay, why? Why do you guys think? I go out, I got my checklist, watching somebody do valve maintenance, watching every move he makes, checking off my checklist. Why did you pass? What did I not do? I evaluated his skill and ability to perform the task. I didn't evaluate his knowledge to recognize and react to AOCs. So that's why the federal government came in and said, nope, performance on the job is no longer acceptable as a sole evaluation method after December 2nd, 2004. You can do it by simulations, okay? Um, a lot of times for certain covered tasks, um, you can't do it live on the pipeline. Okay, one, I'll give you a prime example. Um, one of our covered tasks for the company I worked for was replacing the service valve on a service riser. Okay. The only way you could really do it in a live situation is if you had a service valve that needed to be replaced. We weren't just going to go out and replace a service valve and interrupt the customer service just to do an OQ evaluation. Okay, so what we did was I built a service riser rig in the shop welded some angle iron on the bottom of it so it would stand up by itself, put an air fitting on the end of it where I could hook an air hose up to it and I could pressurize it with air. And I basically made a simulated, a simulated service riser under pressure. I pressurized it to 60 PSI, which was uh, what our MAOP was in our system. And then I would have the employees come in and they would, you know what, anybody know what a Mueller no blow stop changer is? Well, it's a device that you can put on the service riser and it allows you to replace the service valve on a pressurized service riser, right? You run a stopper fitting down into the service riser through the service valve, and you tighten the, the little, yeah, well, it's like a stopper fitting. You run a stopper fitting down in the service riser, tighten it up, and you take the old service valve off, throw it away, put the new service valve on, and you undo your stopper fitting, and you pull the whole rig off. Well, that's what we use to change service valves. Well, I couldn't evaluate somebody doing that in person on a live pipeline unless I had a work order to replace the service valve. So we built a simulator. We had a simulation. And the simulations, if you're going to use simulations, they should be as real world as possible. They should mimic real world conditions as much as possible. When you're doing your evaluations, you need to have objective evaluations and no coaching. Okay, so if you're doing a performance evaluation and the person being evaluated turns around and looks at you and says, I think I forgot the next step. Okay, too bad, so sad. Try it again next month. Right, you can't coach. You're not allowed to coach. Evaluation intervals. Now that we've decided what our evaluation process is going to be, we're going to do a written exam coupled with a performance on the job evaluation for initial, right? Maybe we're going to do performance on the job with oral examination for subsequent evaluations. Now we got to figure out what is our evaluation interval. And that needs to be written in your program for every covered task you've identified. You need to have an evaluation interval, okay? Um, don't just arbitrarily say three years for everything. Okay, or some people, one year for everything, right? It's going to require, uh, it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to consider the complexity or the difficulty of the task. 
how frequently do they do the task, um, you know, other qualifications that are kind of coupled with that task, like welding or joining. Um, just to give you an example real quick, uh, when we first implemented our OQ program, uh, whoever wrote the program uh, had uh, <laughs> performing the odorant sniff test with the DTEX box, right? We used the YZ Systems DTEX box. And we had an old uh, Heath Instruments odorator that we used for checking the odorant. Well, they listed that as a one-year performance evaluation interval. This was a task that was performed every month. We did it 12 times each calendar year. So I went to the administrator of our OQ program and I said, hey, I don't think this needs to be a one-year evaluation interval. We do it every single month. We do it 12 times a year. There's no way we're going to forget how to do it in one year. So I think we can make that a three-year evaluation interval. And he agreed with me. So we changed that evaluation interval to three years because the frequency of what we were doing, yes, was it a, was it a, uh, was it a serious thing? Yeah, it was a very serious uh, task, right? It was, you know, consequence of error was great. You know, if you went out there and did your sniff test and you said, hey, yeah, we're readily detectable, but you really weren't. Uh-oh, what's going to happen when you have a leak? Nobody's going to smell it, right? So we changed it to a three-year performance evaluation interval based on the frequency. Now, if it was something that we were only doing once every six months, maybe a one-year evaluation interval was, would, would, have, would have sufficed, or maybe one-year evaluation interval would have made sense. But if every single month, we were sending somebody out to do the sample test. They would go out and do the sample test at 15 different locations around town. <clears throat> so we changed it to three. How about the evaluators, your performance evaluators? There needs to be something in your program that talks about how you're going to select performance evaluators. Just a quick question. Uh, does an evaluator need to be OQ qualified for the task that they are evaluating? The answer is no, not according to federal regulations. There's nothing in Part 192 that talks about qualifications of an evaluator. It is entirely up to you. If you write it in your program that performance evaluators must be qualified to evaluate the task, or performance evaluators must be qualified to perform the task that they are evaluating. If you write that in your program, then whoever you select to be a performance evaluator they're going to go out and do a performance evaluation on somebody for valve maintenance. They have to be OQ qualified to perform valve maintenance. But it's up to you guys, the operators. Code of Federal Regulations doesn't say anything. If you have, uh, some companies might say in order to be a performance evaluator, you have to be a PE, professional engineer. Okay. Some companies say, like company I work for, Performance evaluators had to be OQ qualified to perform the task they were evaluating. The problem with that was it cut mostly all the supervisors out of the loop. All the supervisors now, even though they were the subject matter experts, probably the most tenured employee in the group, they couldn't do performance evaluations because they didn't maintain their OQ qualifications for all those little tasks that they used to do before they got promoted to the supervisor position. So we ended up with a a situation where we had coworkers evaluating each other. And, you know, I mean, not to question anybody's integrity, but that opens the door wide open for somebody to come in and, and call your program into question, right? non individuals performing covered tasks, okay? Um, you need to have uh, something in your written program to address um, what are the provisions that you're going to allow a non-qualified person to perform a covered task? Now, we talked about it before, you know, uh, you have to let them do it, right? You can't give somebody a class on how to put a 24-inch wrench on a valve and turn it, okay? Sounds good. But until they actually get out there and do it, or 
if you're doing reg station maintenance or changing out gas meters, uh, you know, replacing service regulators on a, on a gas installation, until they actually get out there and get their hands dirty doing it, you know, they really, you know, that's, that's how you build up their level of self-confidence, okay, by allowing them to actually perform the work. And the only way you're allowed to do that is to make sure that they are directed and observed by a qualified person. Remember the scenario I said about the company I used to work for? As soon as you finish your initial training, you got joined at the hip with a qualified veteran who had been with the company for a while, and he was OQ qualified to do everything. And you rode in the truck with him. You were his helper. And depending on who you worked for, your day might have went nice or your day might not have went so good. I worked with a guy one time wherever he used a pipe wrench, where he would drop it. And his helper's job was to pick it up and take it back to the truck. Okay? So, yeah, I hated working for that guy. I was glad to see him retire. So, that's they have to be directed and observed, okay, by a qualified person. And the reason for that is right there in that last bullet. Right there. The reason you want to have an OQ qualified person directing and observing is so if something goes south real quick, that qualified person that's doing the directing and observing can jump in and take charge of the situation and mitigate whatever is happening. Okay. And they also, it's to help keep them safe. Right. You don't want the unqualified person doing something stupid. You've got your qualified person there directing and observing. If you see them about to plug a valve and they forgot to turn the valve off, tell them, hey, turn the valve off first. Don't. <laughs> I want them to see what 300-pound gas sounds like, right? We're going to let them take that plug out and watch him duck and run. <laughs> okay? Now, I've been there. Been there, done that. Okay? First thing you always do is get that little duck out of the way, right? And then you realize I'm still alive. And then... You know, figure out what happened. Oh, I forgot to turn the valve off. Turn it off and look around. Make sure nobody saw you. <laughs> so, yeah, that's another reason for the, the, the qualified person. You know, it's part of the training process. You want to direct and observe. You're there to step in and take charge in case things go south. And you're also there to, to keep that non-qualified person from doing something stupid or hurting himself and possibly even you. Span of control. Um, <clears throat> so now we got it all laid out. We got our evaluation process. We got our evaluation intervals. We got the, the conditions under which we're going to allow non qualified people to perform the job tasks or the covered tasks. Now we need to talk about span of control. Uh, span of control, we're talking about um, how many non qualified people can one qualified individual effectively and safely direct and observe performing a covered task okay it's going to be based on the ability of the observer and it's also going to be based on uh the ability of the person being observed okay you know there's an old saying uh i learned years ago uh <laughs> some people need more supervision than others right if you've got a brand new person who's never been in the pipeline industry at all and he just got hired off of the street He's green as a cucumber. He might need a little bit more supervision than maybe that guy that's been working for the company for 10 years and he just transferred over into your department because he was tired of what he was over there. Now he's over here with you guys. He has a little bit of knowledge of the system. He knows kind of what's going on. He's just never really been OQ qualified to do valve maintenance or read meters or atmospheric corrosion or maybe he doing pipe to soil readings on corrosion, what have you. So he might need a little less supervision than that brand new greenhorn, right? It's going to be based on their qualifications, their abilities, and also the, uh, the person doing the observing. Now, and it's also going to depend on the task, okay? If I'm doing backfilling, right, if I'm out there directing and observing a crew doing backfilling, I could probably stand right here 
and watch eight or ten people backfill a ditch, right? And be pretty safe about it because we trained them. You put all the edibles on this side of the ditch. You put all the non-edibles on that side of the ditch. The only thing that goes back in the ditch on top of the pipeline is what? Edibles, right? We don't put non-edibles, rocks, trash, debris. We don't throw that stuff back in the hole. So I can stand there and direct and observe maybe eight or ten people doing that. So I'd have a span of control like eight to one. Eight non-qualifieds to one qualified. But what about leak survey? How many people can I effectively direct and observe doing a leak survey with a flame pack? Maybe one, right? <laughs> you know, unless you want to waste time and have three people out there on the same pipeline doing leak survey right there close to you. So it's going to depend on the task. Something like leak survey, you might see a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, valve maintenance. Maybe you're going to see a one-to-one -one ratio. You can only do valve maintenance on one valve at a time, right? How many people does it take to turn one valve? Usually one person. Unless you got one of those old ancient Nordstrom plug valves that's got that green Play-Doh grease in it, then you might have to get two people on the end of a four-foot cheater bar to get it to move, okay? Get all that done before the inspector comes, <laughs> okay? But span of control. How many qualified people or how many non-qualified people can one how many non-qualified people can one qualified person safely and effectively direct and observe? That's going to be your span of control, all right? I'll tell you right now what looks 100% uh, suspicious and suspect <laughs> to an inspector when they come in and they see you've got a covered task list of like 30 tasks, and every single one of them is a three-year performance evaluation interval, and every single one of them is a one-to-four span of control. Okay, that tells me you didn't put much thought into each one of those covered tasks. Okay, you need to you need to talk about it. Get with your subject matter experts. Talk to some people. Hey, how many people do you feel like you can effectively and safely direct and observe performing this task? Uh, probably two. One to two, or two to one. Backfilling, maybe that's a more thought uh, into your evaluation intervals and you uh, uh, some thought into your span of control numbers okay it shouldn't be the same for every, every task I just said um, backfilling should not be the same span of control as leak survey okay there's no way you can direct and observe <laughs> eight people doing leak survey at the same time Span of control is not adequate under certain circumstances. Certain covered tasks, the span of control is going to be uh, zero to one. That means zero non-qualified, one qualified. That means you're not going to allow non-qualified people to perform this covered task at all. And one of those examples is hot tapping. Everybody know what hot tapping is? What do you? Tap a live energized pipe to put a service line on it. Maybe you get a main out there, and you're going to go out there and hook up your tapping equipment, and you've got to put a hole in the top of that pipe so you can put a saddle tee on it and run a service. That's hot tapping. Hot tapping is not allowed to be done by non-qualified people. So how do you qualify somebody on hot tapping? Simulation. Set up a rig in the shop. Pressurize that pipe with air pressure. You let them use the tools that they would use on an energized pipeline. And once they've demonstrated proficiency to your satisfaction, that they can use that tool and they can do a tap on a pipe in the shop that's pressurized with 60 pounds of air pressure in a safe, controlled environment. Then you can say, all right. Then you take them out and you let them do a live tap on the pipeline. You qualified them under a simulation. Okay, you use a simulation to qualify that person. They're not allowed to do it under direct observation, or a qualified person cannot direct and observe them performing it on a live pressurized pipeline. 
they have to be qualified first. And you qualify them in that scenario with simulation. There needs to be some language in your program to talk about uh, how you're going to evaluate individuals who were possibly involved in an accident or an incident. If you have an incident, okay, just a um, out of this world example, you have somebody that did leak survey through a neighborhood and he said no leaks were indicated. Next week, you have a house explosion in that same neighborhood. Investigation reveals you had a massive underground leak on the main out at the street right in front of that house. Hmm. John Q. Public just did leak survey last week and he said there was no leaks detected. So you bring that individual back in. How, are, how is your company going to handle that kind of a situation? If the investigation reveals that his actions contributed to that incident, what are you going to do? Are you going to suspend his qualifications indefinitely? Are you going to suspend his qualifications uh, pending uh, retraining and reevaluation? Are you going to suspend his qualifications pending the results of the investigation? Um, you know, are you going to allow him to continue performing the covered task until the results of the investigation come back? You need to explain all that in your program. How are we going to deal with this situation? The company I work for, um, if they suspected that your actions contributed to an incident, your qualification for that task was immediately suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. So you were not allowed to perform that covered task anymore until the, until the investigation was done. Now, if the investigation said, uh, investigation reveals that Stephen Kirkland's actions did not contribute to this incident, then my qualification was reinstated and I was back to work doing leak service whatever task might have been so but you have to explain how your company's going to handle that that has to be part of your written program how are you going to evaluate individuals you feel might no longer be qualified to perform the task whether it be physical limitations if you have a covered task where it requires uh you know vision to within a certain level if somebody's wearing glasses, if you've specified for that covered task, uh, you know, vision needs to be correctable to 2020. And this guy goes back to the eye doctor and he comes back and gives you the bad news. My vision's, I can still see, but it's correctable to 2040. His vision is no longer correctable to the requirements for that covered task. So what are we gonna do? Or you have another situation where maybe somebody uh, was your was your valve maintenance guy, and he got in a car wreck and messed up his back. Now he's on 50% disability. Uh, he's disabled, doesn't really possess the physical strength and ability to actually do valve maintenance anymore. How are you going to handle that situation? You need to spell that out in your program. You know, maybe uh, a performance evaluation needs to be done or Maybe you suspend his qualifications for that covered task pending reevaluation at a future date, right? You just maybe you got to call the person in and say, "Hey, uh, you know, you were involved in that automobile accident. I know you messed your back up. You're a 50% disability. You gave me your light duty slip, so we're going to have to suspend your qualifications until you're no longer on duty and you can actually do the job. Suspend their qualifications temporarily while they're on light duty." However your company is going to handle that situation, that needs to be written down in your program. Prolonged absence from performing the covered task is another example. If you have somebody that qualified to do a particular covered task on July 1st, 2020, say it's a three-year performance evaluation interval. It's been two years since he had his performance evaluation and he has not performed the covered task one time. Are we going to trust that he's still proficient at performing that covered task? It's a three-year performance evaluation interval, but if you look at the periodicity, he hasn't performed it one time since he successfully passed his performance evaluation and was qualified. 
Maybe you want to put something in your company's program to talk about that. The company I work for, we have proficiency periodicities for every covered task. Most of them were six months. So even if you qualified uh, and your evaluation is not expired yet, if you hadn't performed that covered task in over six months, you weren't allowed to do it again until somebody whose proficiency had not lapsed came out and watched you do it, and then they signed off saying, yep, Steven's still proficient. He still knows what he's doing. So however your company wants to, to handle that, if you want to put proficiency periodicities in there, that is perfectly within your right as a pipeline operator. It's up to you. If it's up to your company. So there's different courses of action you can take. Uh, you can do reevaluation. The individual may be reevaluated in accordance with the OQ program. Anybody you feel like may be no longer qualified to perform the task, they can be reevaluated. You can say, you know what, uh, I want to do another performance evaluation on you. Why? Because it's been two years and you haven't performed the task one time. So before I cut you loose to go do this, I want to do another performance evaluation. Go out and do another performance evaluation. Yeah. If that's what your company wants to do, that's what you can do. Put it in writing as part of your program and go do it. Uh, training and reevaluation. You know, you need to consider whether training would be appropriate prior to the reevaluation. If it's a task that nobody ever does, I'll give you an example. We had as a covered task in our in our company uprating. Uprating. Right? You guys know what uprating is, right? That's where you're going to take a pipeline that maybe was operating at 20 PSI for 100 years. Now, all of a sudden, we decide, you know what? It's going to be a lot more cost effective if we just uprate that pipe and operate it at 50 PSI now instead of 20, instead of running bigger pipe. You're going to uprate that pipeline. Let it operate now at a higher pressure. In 21 years with the company, we never uprated a single pipe but it was listed on our program as one of the covered tasks, right? But we had it specified that uh, whenever an uprating project was to be embarked upon, those employees who would be involved in that project would receive training and a performance evaluation to be OQ qualified on uprating. So it was listed as a, a task, but nobody was qualified to do it because we never had an uprating project in all the years that I even worked there. So you need to consider, do we need training? Has it been so long that, you know, they forgot? Maybe what you can do, maybe have them take a written test to test their knowledge first. So you still remember what you need to know. If you pass this written test and we go out and do a performance evaluation, make sure you still know how to do it and you're good to go. If they fail that written test, maybe you need to have them go through some remedial training. You can stop using that individual for the covered task. Like I said before, you can say, hey, you know what? Uh, you're on light duty. I can't have you performing this covered task now because uh, you know, you're not allowed to lift more than five pounds. No, no strenuous activity, no prolonged standing, no prolonged sitting. You're basically allowed to sit here and breathe. That's it. So we're not gonna let you do any of these covered tasks today. We're gonna suspend your covered task. We're gonna suspend your OQ until you're off light duty, right? We also need to have something in our program to talk about how we are communicating change. How are we communicating change to our employees when we make a change to our OQ program? Whether it's performance evaluation methods, performance evaluation intervals, span of control, whether you're reassigning responsibility for covered tasks from one group to another, any change you make to your OQ program needs to be communicated to every employee in that company who might possibly have to go out and perform a covered task. Every employee in that company that works on your pipeline needs to be communicated that change. That change needs to be shared with everybody. So what you need to put in your program is, how is my company going to communicate these changes to all of our employees? Are you gonna send emails? Are you gonna have all hands meetings where everybody signs in? and you share that information with the whole entire group. If you have a company small enough, that's a perfectly acceptable way of doing it. 
but you need to have it spelled out in your program how you're going to do it. The procedure should include level of communication. What is the actual impact of the covered task? Does it affect the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform the covered task? The timing of the communication. You need to designate within X number of days of a change being implemented, uh, you know, this, this, and this needs to happen, whether it be all hands meeting, whether it be uh, frontline supervisors receive an email and information is disseminated down to the, the newest hire on the, on, the, on the staff, right? You need to have that spelled out in your program how you're going to communicate those changes. And types of communication. You can have written communication, oral communication, tailgate discussions, training sessions, and you need to document. Document that you had these meetings where you shared this information. Document that you sent your frontline supervisors the email with maybe an attachment that they need to share with all of their employees that they're responsible for supervising. You need to have something in your program to designate uh, how you're going to provide training as appropriate. Determine the knowledge that are needed to recover task in a competent manner and focus on the training if needed. Have it spelled out in your program, maybe uh, different scenarios that might trigger the need for training. Okay, that needs to be spelled out in your program. Does the training program have to be operator created? You guys have to develop your own training program. No. You can use training programs developed by others as long as it fits your pipeline facility. Okay, example, you don't want to bring in a training program for ball valves if all you have is plug valves. Okay, there's different methods for doing maintenance on ball valves versus plug valves. You've got to make sure that if you're going to use an off-the-shelf training program, you, you got to make sure that it is applicable to your facility for your installation. Your training program should consider knowledge of elements, the O&M, knowledge and pertinent policies, procedures, job methods, knowledge of appropriate abnormal operating conditions. You need to train people for that, okay? If, for example, you went through and did a review of your OQ program and your subject matter experts came in and said, hey, you know, uh, discovered a few more AOCs that need to be added to the list, okay? We did three more AOCs to the list for this covered task. Employees performing that covered task need to be train on what those AOCs are and how to appropriately react to those AOCs. And I already talked to you guys about the Pipes Act. July 1st, 2020 was the effective date after July 1st, 2020. Any significant changes that you make to your OQ program that you submitted to CPUC for approval and they approved it, if you make significant changes, you have to notify them of those changes. Now, uh, FEMSA has went in and actually determined and made a list of some things that they consider to be a significant change. Deleting or removing covered tasks is a significant change. Um, uh, Reestablishing performance evaluation intervals or span of control, that's a significant change. Any significant changes you make to your system or your, or your program needs to be communicated with uh, the California Public Utilities Commission. And it needs to be done in accordance with 192.18. And uh, any questions for me? Well, before we go to lunch, I want to just point out to you one section that wasn't really in the slide. Okay. If you go into 192 and you look at 807, okay, is your record keeping requirements for OQ. Paragraph A tells you all the information that you need to have in your OQ records. 
You need to have the name of the individual. You need to have a unique identifier, whether it's an employee number. Uh, you need to have the covered task that they're qualified to perform. You need to have the qualification date and the qualification method used, right? And what happens a lot of times, though, is if you look at paragraph B, paragraph B says all records supporting an individual's qualification must be retained while the employee or while the tech, while the individual is performing the covered task and for five years after they're no longer performing the covered task, right? So what, what are these documents? What do they look like? Well, if you're using a written test, part of your evaluation process for that covered task, and say your program says a passing score on any written test is 80%, okay? I come in as an inspector, you show me your spreadsheet that has your list of employees, employee number, the covered task that they're qualified to perform, the date they were qualified, the evaluation method used. You show me that and I'll say, okay, well, let me see here. It looks like uh, John Doe and Jane Q. Public were qualified to do leak survey on the exact same day. And your initial qualification method for that is written test and performance on the job evaluation. So um, I want to see the written test that they took and passed, and I want to see the performance evaluation form that your performance evaluator completed. Those are two documents that support those individual qualifications. So if they took a written test and passed it, put that in their OQ folder. The evaluator handed you a performance evaluation where he signed off and said, yes, they're qualified. Put that in their OQ folder. The inspector asked for those supporting documents. You need to be able to provide it. So that's a, a lot of uh, a lot of people fall short in that area. Okay, they they give you a good, nice, pretty looking Excel spreadsheet with everybody's name on it, but then when you ask, uh, let me see documentation of, let me see the supporting documentation for John Doe's OQ qualification valve maintenance. And well, initial qualification is a written test. Here's the written test. Here's his most re recent evaluation. Okay, good to go. Just remember, you have to maintain that supporting documentation. And if nobody has any questions for me, I'll turn it back over to you, Jason. My contact information is in the book, very first page. And uh, you see there, we got a whole list of all the instructor staff at uh, FEMSA TQ. Like Letty said, you can call us anytime you want. We'll talk to you on the phone. Uh, we'll answer questions. Um, the only thing is, uh, if you need an official interpretation from FEMSA, we are not empowered to offer official interpretations. If you need an official interpretation from FEMSA, you need to send a request to headquarters in D.C. Okay? All right. Well, thank you.